I'm Andrew Schwartz, and you're listening to The Truth of the Matter, a podcast by CSIS where we break down the top policy issues of the day and talk with the people that can help us best understand what's really going on. To get to the truth of the matter about Russian internet trolls, about the great North Atlantic Fellows Organization, we have with us a co-founder of NAFO, Matt Moores. Matt, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Andrew. It's really nice to be here. I appreciate you having me on. Well, NAFO, or hashtag NAFO, the movement has really taken off. We had a great event with you here at CSIS last week, which our listeners can watch on demand. It was with Seth Jones and and Matt and, and others at CSIS. Of course, Kathleen McKinnis, who hosts our Smart Women, Smart Power project and podcast. So, Matt, tell me, what is NAFO and how did it come into being? I mean, it started as a joke. This is something that came out of a couple of guys who have been following Russia generally, but then the conflict in Ukraine more specifically for a long time. You know, my involvement in it is I saw what this guy Camille doing, which is he was taking these funny pictures and using them to mock Russian government officials or just to make fun of the narratives that the Russians were trying to put forward. Uh, so I saw it. I thought it was interesting. I thought it was funny. So, you know, I got involved, started making pictures with it also, sharing them out to my audience online and then using the fella avatar, which is the little cartoon dog wearing variations of uh, clothing. So some of them times you'll see him with a track suit on. And then it's expanded into uh, military uniforms, holding weapons, holding, you know, whatever. It's sort of become a lot more abstract now. There's the cat fellas and ghost fellas. But anyway, what it really is, is just about sticking your finger in the eye of these Russian propagandists who have been so successful for such a long time of shaping narratives online and sort of using the digital information space uh, to further their often criminal uh, agendas. So you're basically using Internet culture to mock the Russians and their disinformation campaigns. That's absolutely correct. Okay, so give me an example of doing just that. I mean, the the memes you have of the Shiba Inu dogs, um, you know, dressed in military garb, the St. Javelin fella sticker where the dog is holding a, a Javelin missile. It, it, it's really, it's, it's the first time I've seen this kind of internet culture really take off in a national security sense. You're mixing modern anti-info messaging with great internet culture. How did that idea really come about? I mean, it's absolutely organic. I think that any of us who would try to sit in front of you and say, uh, back in May, we had this master plan to turn a cartoon dog into a powerful weapon to use against Russian disinformation. You know, that's silly. That's not true. This sort of evolved organically out of a culture that already exists that was using you know, jokes and humor and satire to push back against these kinds of harmful narratives online. And if you look specifically you know, at the national security Twitter community, I think that you can see the origins of this for a long time. Again, with the humor, with uh, the funny memes, and I think that that structure already existing really did help this to grow because there already was an audience for it. You know, people were ready to jump on this because it's funny. I mean, that's really the, the root of it is that this is funny. Like if you look at the pictures, if you look at the posts that people are making, there's a lot of people who, and I'm not talking about myself, I'm talking about there's a lot of people involved who are genuinely very funny. And that's helped this to grow. You, We can see from a couple of posts back in May that there's now tens of thousands of people around the world sharing pictures of these dogs and laughing at the Russians. And one of the things that's so interesting to me is that the people who have jumped onto this include the Ukrainian defense minister, Alexei Reznikov, the Estonian prime minister, members of the United States Congress. You yourself are a retired Marine. These are serious national security people using these methods to support the Ukrainian people, aren't they? Yeah, you know, and I think that uh, that's the great thing about humor, right, is that it can bring together people from across all walks of life and across all professions and give them an outlet. I think that's one really important thing that this does, because for the better part of a decade, possibly longer, everyone who has been a professional in these spaces where you're exposed to the Russian disinformation campaigns has just sort of been suffering under this. Uh, anytime that you're publishing something, anytime 
as a journalist is, is putting something out into social media, they've been bombarded by these organized uh, government controlled networks, Russian propagandists. And I think people have really just had enough, right? So that's something that's really united people is that they can have fun while pushing back against something that's been a tremendous frustration at the very least, but you know, in, in many cases, an actual physical danger to people who are living across Europe and wherever the Russian military or their intelligence services operate. So Matt, what's the impact that this has had on Russian disinformation? Is it something you can measure or are there anecdotes? Certainly you've raised the awareness in the national security community. Loads and loads of people are talking about this and, and as you said, sharing these memes, buying the merchandise from the stjavelin.com website, which all the proceeds, of course, go to help the Ukrainians. What's been the impact in pushing back against Russian disinformation? Well, you know, that's, um, I'm not a scholar, so I don't follow this. Can't bring the statistics to you, but you can see their frustration with it. I think that you can point to several events that demonstrate how angry all of this is making the Russians. I think it's frustrating to them because they have built at least the mystique of being extremely proficient in the information space. For years now in the West, we've been talking about their bot networks and you know, their ability uh, to create and maintain narratives that support their agenda. And I think that they see this now not working. And I think that it makes them really angry and that they're looking already to see like what's wrong, you know, what's the explanation for this? Why aren't our messages getting through? To me, it's very funny to see them focusing in on these cartoon dogs and saying like, oh, this must be it. It's gotta be, it's gotta be this. We saw on RT, one of the Kremlin's main disinfo news sources, they're actually talking about NAFO and saying that we're a CIA operation or, or whatever it is, which is hilarious to us, you know? It also points to how predictable they are in a lot of what they do. You know, anytime that they're getting any kind of pushback, they're turning to the same explanation. It's like, oh, it's Russophobia, it's a CIA, it's all of these things besides the clear explanation, which is that people who are tired of being oppressed by the Russian government uh, are saying enough's enough. But one of the ways that we stick our finger back in the eye to that is, you know, if you look at any fellow's profile, you'll see the dog avatar, but then their location will often be Langley, Virginia. They say, we're CIA. Yeah, sure. We're CIA. And they say, you know, Russophobes, uh, like, yes, good morning, fellow Russophobes. You know, the things that they accuse us of don't mean anything. So to turn that into a joke against them. It's funny because that, from what I've seen is one of the things that they're really incapable of handling is being made fun of. We see an example of that with one of the earliest real uh, successes of NAFO that got a lot of attention was this incident with the Russian ambassador, Mikhail Ulyanov, uh, who got into a tangle with two or 300 cartoon dogs online and really let it take apart his entire day. I mean, this man who's a career diplomat in the Russian government, decades of service, was completely infuriated and had no idea you know, how to react. So he's trying to respond to all of these people who are making fun of his tweets and he... I think that if anybody who spends a lot of time online, especially professionally, you know, you know, in the back of your head that when someone is trolling you, someone's making fun of you, the worst possible thing that you can do is to engage with it, right? There's something about these cartoon dogs who the Russians just can't resist. So Olyanov, he put something out onto his Twitter, something repulsive, I forget exactly what it was, basically trying to rationalize why buy, Russia needs to bomb civilians. Uh, one of the fellas replied to him, his name's Livfast Dai Young, which is Always funny to say people's online handles uh, out loud, but he replied to him and you know just made fun of him. He said, "You know what you're saying is ridiculous." And Olyanov replied to him and said, uh, "You pronounce this nonsense, not me," which is now a world famous meme. You can buy it on T-shirts, it's on mugs, and being ridiculed in that way it just put him so completely outside of his ability to, to to react rationally that he did. He spent the rest of the day just arguing with cartoon dogs online, which makes him look ridiculous. Eventually, Olyanov logged off and he was gone for a week. Nobody knew where he went. There was um, some speculation. I thought maybe he was trying to defect to NAFO. I offered him assistance if he presented himself at any uh, allied embassy. <clears throat> but he did show up a week later and he tweeted out, the time has now returned for me to resume tweeting after my long planned vacation in which I was taking care of. Yeah, you know, it's like, okay, buddy. Like, let's be real. Somebody came into your office and said, Mikhail, put down the phone, right? Like, that's what really happened. So 
you know, you can see concrete effects like that. But uh, what I'm most proud of, though, is the fundraising that goes hand in hand with what we're doing. So we're tying these information, I don't want to say campaigns, but tying what we do online to, to the real world. So, you know, if you are part of NAFO, you're not just arguing with, you know, Russians online. You're not just pushing back against this propaganda. You're doing something real. You know, you're raising money for soldiers who are defending Ukraine, who are actually fighting against an army that is committing unspeakably horrible acts. So, you know, there is this real world impact that's very concrete and that's inarguable. Can we say what the money has actually gone for? What are some of the things that the money that NAFO has raised, what is it going towards in Ukraine? So one of the one of the first fundraiser, well, the first fundraiser that we were doing was to support the Georgian Legion. And the source of that money is when Camille started this, he was making his little fella avatars for people. People wanted one. They said, you know, how do, how do I get one of these? And uh, Camille told uh, this person, hey, if you send, uh, Camille's living in the UK, says, you know, send 10 quid to the Georgian Legion, I'll you know, throw you one of these fellas. So it started from there. As we saw more people were you know, willing to do that and were excited about being a part of this, we thought, okay, you know, there's an opportunity here to do some real good. So the first fundraiser that we did was raising money to buy armor plates for bulletproof vests for soldiers in the Georgian Legion. Uh, so we set you know, a reasonable goal. We're like, okay, let's get 20, 20 plates. And we blew through that, I mean, almost immediately. So then it was, okay, well, shoot, let's try to get to 50. And then it's 100. And now if we're going forward, that was in, I guess, late May, early June that that started. We're now in mid-October. Uh, we're past $300,000 raised specifically for the Georgian Legion. And they're using that money to buy equipment, supplies, food, ammunition, clothing, you know, whatever it is that they need as a volunteer military unit fighting for Ukraine. You've also mentioned St. Javelin. That was one of the earlier things that we did. I reached out to Christian Boris, who runs the St. Javelin company. I told him what we were doing. He was familiar with it. He thought it was really funny. And I said, you know, what do you think about kind of teaming up with this? We'll create some shirts, some merchandise that you can sell on the website, and we'll see where it goes. So that's been enormously successful. Between direct donations going to the Legion and the sale of merchandise on St. Javelin, we're past a million dollars raised for soldiers in Ukraine. That's incredible. And this has just been in a few months, right? That's right. Yeah, this is just a few months. And also without what you'd consider traditional advertising, right? You're not putting out uh, ads in newspapers. There's been relatively few interviews that any of us have done. This is, I think, the third time I'm actually speaking with anyone in a format like this. So it's been really amazing to see how, how much that we've been able to accomplish in this you know, very organic and natural way, just through people wanting to come together and, and do something good. What are the goals going forward? I, you know, obviously you wanna keep this going and help the Ukrainians. What are some of the goals going forward? The big goal, of course, is to support the soldiers who are fighting in Ukraine. So in that vein, we've developed now a closer relationship with St. Javelin. We're now officially partnered with them. We're working on new lines of merchandise. We're working on specific funding operations. One of the things that's really important to us in NAFO is that we are directly supporting soldiers. So we like to identify new units and we like to identify specific needs, right? What do they want? Do they need generators? Do they need clothing? Do they need ammunition? What is it? And we'll set those fundraisers up specifically to support that. So right now, St. Javelin's working on a major winter campaign to buy generators and clothing for soldiers in Ukraine. I have the numbers in front of me, but I misplaced my note. But we're looking to outfit around 3,300 soldiers with a full set of winter clothing, sleeping bags, and generators that they'll need to successfully fight through the winter season, You know, which I think people who don't even particularly know much about the conflict understand that in that part of the world, the winters are particularly bitter. So this is something that's desperately needed and that we're very happy and proud to be a part of trying to get these people what they need so that they can fight. How much do you think the evolution of media has really contributed to the success of this? You know, what's changed in the media landscape within the past decade that's made way for your success on social media with this? You know, uh, I think about this a lot and I'm not... I'm not really sure. You know, I don't know 
that the media landscape has changed so much because just because you know in the west we have this idea that freedom of speech is incredibly important right and that when you're reporting information it's important to put out both sides of the of the story i don't disagree with that i think that those are important things and i don't think that that's something that necessarily should change but i do think what has changed is that there's a greatly increased awareness of how governments like russia manipulate information spaces I think that if you walked up to someone on the street 10 or 12 years ago and you asked them what they think about bot farms uh, or these sort of online disinformation campaigns, they wouldn't have any idea what you're talking about. But now we're so exposed to it, it's so widely discussed in not just online, but in traditional media as well, that practically I think anyone in the United States or any place else really, if you're asking them about that, they're going to at least have an idea of what you're talking about. They're not going to be looking at you like you're crazy. So I think that there is an increased awareness, like I said, of the role that governments play in trying to shape the information space. And I think that that increased literacy makes it possible to do what we're doing, where it's not just going to appeal to a limited group of researchers or journalists or people who work in the military or national security or national relations. What we're doing appeals to a much wider group of people because they're read into it. They understand how it impacts them. And they want to be a part of pushing back against that, about supporting uh, these ideals that we hold dear, freedom and democracy, a resistance to tyrannical governments like Russia's. You know, Matt, you spoke about the mystique of Russia being really good at disinformation, fake news. We've been talking about that in this country for, for years now, but most acutely with our recent elections Are they really good at this stuff? And you guys have had some success in really annoying them, but are they good at this stuff? And and do we need to really keep at it to keep them on their toes here? I think that they are good at it. I think that they also have the infrastructure in place to support this at at a very wide scale. You know, they actually are employing people whose job it is all day to sit down and think about how do I influence opinion? in a way that supports the regime's narratives and agendas. So while it's fun to to make fun of them and their failures, they're still a serious enemy. And that goes too for their military. You know, I think that as a whole, Putin was successful in building up the mystique of Russia as a world power, as having a first-class military, of being a, a real threat in all domains. I don't think that that's not true. You know, I think that uh, if you look in Ukraine, even though the Russian military has not been able to achieve the objectives that it set out to, you know, they were not able to capture Kiev in three days. They have not been able to displace Zelensky's government, but they have inflicted tremendous suffering and they have killed scores of people. So to say that the Russians aren't dangerous or they're not a threat or that we can't ignore them, that's simply not true. They absolutely are. And to say that they're not, I don't know. I, I think that it would be insulting to people, not just in Ukraine, but globally, who suffer from that regime. How do you see age as a factor in all of this? The Russian officials are presumed to be older than you guys who partake in online social media movements. Do you think at this point being younger is actually an advantage? I don't really think it's about age. You know, I'm almost 40, so I'm not exactly young. A lot of people who are involved in this are not young. You know, I know that there are plenty of fellows who are in their 50s or 60s. And, you know, these heads of state who are changing their avatars to be fellas or throwing hashtag NAFO in their bio, they are certainly not teenagers, right? I don't see NAFO as being a particularly youthful movement. I think that it really does encompass a full range of experience and, and people who are in the world. I think that what they struggle with is not, not really knowing how to react to it. They've never been up against something like this. They don't know how to handle a group of people who are not united by their government. So they're not being paid to do these things and they're not being handed the script. This is something where it's thousands of people who are united by an idea and the desire to do good. And that makes what we're doing extremely flexible. It makes us able to react and change direction much more fluidly. And the Russians can't do that because they have a boss. They have approved narratives that they have to stick to. 
so they are not able to flow with the situation. So I see that as being much more of a restriction on them than age. Well, Matt, this is fascinating. Thank you very much. We hope to have you back soon and stay close to CSIS and let us know if there's anything we can do to help spread hashtag NAFO. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you very much for having me on and NAFO expansion is non-negotiable. <laughs> If you enjoyed this podcast, check out our larger suite of CSIS podcasts from Into Africa, The Asia Chessboard, China Power, AIDS 2020, The Trade Guys, Smart Women, Smart Power, and more. You can listen to them all on major streaming platforms like iTunes and Spotify. Visit csis.org slash podcasts to see our full catalog 